secret. Harry collected the money, and Jack's assignment, he was, see, Jack was only like 13, 12 or 13 at the time, but he was, he was singing. He had a nickname, Leon Zwardo. <laughs> That's what he named himself. I don't ask me how. Anyway, so he he was used to chase the audience out of the uh, theater after the show was over, because a lot of times they'd want to stay. At the turn of the century, movies reflected the vision of America shared by Thomas Edison and the other men who invented the film industry. Most of these old stock Protestants saw film as an amusement for the working classes. The films presented negative images of hook-nosed Jews, blacks, and others. They championed an idea of America where the white upper classes ruled and immigrants knew their place. Take one movie, just one movie. Uh, biographs uh, the fights of nations. The Jews meet on the street and a policeman comes up to run off one of them who's peddling neckties. One of the other Jews pulls out money and hands it to the policeman as a bribe to let his friend sell the neckties. There is a thread connected to the money, so as the cop walks away smugly, the money pops out of his pocket, back into the Jew's pocket. They're petty merchants, they jabber, and they corrupt cops. It's all so perfect. The blacks, they're in a saloon, and a fight ensues in which a huge razor is pulled. So that blacks dance, they fight over women, and they fight with razors. Then, two Scotsmen fight nobly, with courage and dignity. Then it cuts to the end, and the ethnic groups that are thought to be noble come out into a kind of tableau. John Bull comes out and shakes hands with everybody. Johnny Ribb from the Confederacy comes out and takes a bow. The Scotsman comes out and takes a bow. And finally, Uncle Sam comes out and takes a bow. No Jews, no blacks. In effect, immigration has happened but until the immigrants and the blacks learn what it's like to be old stock, they're not really in it yet. The highest artistic achievement of pre-Jewish American cinema was the box office hit, Birth of a Nation, by D.W. Griffith. The explicitly racist story glorified the Ku Klux Klan and played on white America's fear of racial intermixing. These films reflected popular American values of their era. Ironically, they were being shown in Jewish-run theaters to audiences of Jews and other immigrants. Independently of each other, the Warner Brothers, Zukor, Goldwyn, Lasky, and Lemley began exhibiting the short films produced by the Edison men. They upgraded their theaters and sought ways to attract the middle class. Here, they drew on their Jewish experience. The Jewish tradition has placed an enormous value on high culture, on learning and the finest expressions of music and, and art. At the same time, the experience of being on the margins meant that your identity was integrally tied to the maintenance of popular culture, collective norms at the lowest common denominator. And that combination of a commitment to high culture on the one hand and an appreciation of low culture or popular culture on the other was the perfect preparation. Adolf Zucker turning to, to a Sarah Bernhardt for a, a popular film, I think, is a case in point. Adolf Zucker believed that to attract the middle class, one had to change not just the theaters, but the films. Bypassing Edison, he imported from France this film, featuring a famous stage actress, 
he premiered it in a Broadway theater. Not wanting to depend on Europeans for quality films, Carl Lemley and the other Jewish exhibitors began producing their own films. Edison decided that the Jews had overstepped their bounds. To shut them out in 1908, he organized a producer's trust that declared a monopoly on film production in America. Seven years later, Edison's trust would lose its monopoly in the courts. But in 1912, to escape Edison and the goons he sent to enforce his control of the industry, the future moguls headed west to the orange groves of California. Here they found immediate success. Now, why did they move to California? I believe that they went there because California was a raw social environment. And although there was a social system in place, it was nowhere near as sophisticated and nowhere near as entrenched as the social hierarchy in Boston or New York or even Chicago, where these moguls came from. So coming to California, they realized that they could create their own social environment. They could create an empire of their own, not only on screen, but within their own lives and their own social environment. And that's precisely what they did. In 1915, Carl Lemley had decided to open a very large plant in the valley north of uh, Hollywood, uh, which they called Universal City. And they got themselves a postal designation for Universal City with its own mayor and its own police force, a, a gigantic facility that includes all necessities for designing films, building sets, photographing them, editing them, costuming them, uh, writing the scripts, housing the executives, all under one piece of property, which he would people with his relatives, very famously brought over from Laupheim, uh, Germany. And they were very pleased that this was, you know, the first movie-making city in the world. Among the movie industry's 30,000 employees are men and women from nearly 300 trades and professions. Following Lemley by 1920, Harry Cohen, Zucker, Goldwyn, Fox, and Mayer had set up their own studios, Golden Shtetls, where each was clearly in charge. Show me what you are made of. If you have the slightest doubt, be man enough to step aside and let the go-getters go ahead. I will not have quitters or lazy men working for Universal. That's straight from the shoulder, isn't it? They were tough. They had to be tough. They came up from the ghettos, most of them. Um, they had to survive in a business that was cutthroat. And uh, if they didn't cut throats first, uh, their own would be done. So only the tough survived. And these guys were ruthless. They used women. They treated stars uh, brutally sometimes. But they had redeeming qualities, too. I mean, they were sentimental. My god, Louis V. Mayer would cry at the drop of a handkerchief. Um, and they were, most of all, showmen. And they loved movies. They lived for movies. And that's uh, a greatness that uh, does not exist today. I'd been here about a week on the lot in 1937, and Adolf Zucker, who was head of Paramount, sent me to Columbia to deliver a message to Harry Cohen, who was the head of Columbia Pictures. And he's sitting at his desk, which is elevated about six inches off the floor. And he's on the phone, other hand extended. He's getting a manicure, a barber's cutting his hair, and he's getting a shoe shine. Now, that's something to go and see a man on the phone, head of a studio, manicure, shoe shine, and a haircut all at the same time. And I said, man, this is Hollywood. Let me, Adam. How the hell are you? Good trip. My name is Jack Lipnick. I run this stump. And I'm from New York myself. Minsk, if you want to go all the way back. The writer is king here at Capitol Pictures. You don't believe me? Take a look at your paycheck at the end of every week. That's what we think of the writer. So what kind of pictures does he like? Uh, Mr. Fink hasn't given a preference, Mr. Lipnick. So how about it, Bart? Well, uh, 
To be honest, I, I, I don't go to the pictures much, Mr. Lipnick. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's just fine. You probably walked in here thinking that was going to be a handicap, thinking that we wanted people who knew something about the media, maybe even thinking there was all kinds of technical mumbo-jumbo to learn. You were that wrong. We're only interested in one thing. Can you tell a story, Bart? Can you make us laugh? Can you make us cry? Can you make us want to break out and enjoy a song? Is that more than one thing? Okay. The point is, I run this stump, and I don't know the technical mumbo-jumbo. Why do I run it? Because I got horse sense, goddammit. Showmanship! And also, and I hope I told you this, I am bigger and meaner and louder than any other kike in this town. Did you tell him that, Lou? And I don't mean my dick is bigger than yours. It's not a sexual thing, although you're the writer, you know more about that. Coffee? Jack Warner was considered a primitive, uh, uh, told terrible jokes. Uh, and yet, that studio produced a, a legacy of tremendous films, from the jazz singer to Casablanca to My Fair Lady. So he must have been doing something right. There's a very romantic notion that Hollywood movies were made by artists. The director and the writer and to a certain extent the stars actually made these movies. Those were the real artists and these guys were only businessmen. I would place the artistic sensibility not with the director, but with the studio head. And for those who say, well, this is ridiculous, I would say from beginning to end, the executive had the primary input into the picture and supervised every aspect of production over and above the fact that beyond any individual picture, it was the executive who created the entire studio apparatus. Every producer who worked there, every director who worked there, every writer who worked there, and every star who worked there was part of the larger system that was created by the Hollywood Jews. I'm not sure that there was an, quote, American dream before the Jews came to Hollywood and uh, invented it. Um, what you had was a westward movement, and you had the idea of freedom, but you didn't have uh, what we have today, which is a popular culture that creates uh, dreams. That's a dream factory. <laughs> Once the studios were in place, the Jewish moguls produced hundreds of feature-length films each year. Movies that presented America with a new vision of itself. A vision that was very different from that of the establishment filmmakers of the Edison Trust. Be optimistic, don't you be a mourner. Brighten up that corner and smile. Don't wear a long face, it's never in style. And smile. They got to put their hopes and aspirations and mythologies about what a perfect life would be like, which is something I think people probably spend a long time thinking about when they have a very imperfect life with a great deal of persecution, disempowerment. You know, what would the system be if we could make it up and show it to you? I want to make that come to life for every boy in this land. Yes, and all light it up like that, too. You see, you see, boys forget what their country means by just reading the land of the free in history books. When they get to be men, they forget even more. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books, Miss Saunders. Men should hold it up in front of them every single day of their lives and say, I'm free to think and to speak. My ancestors couldn't, I can. And my children will. The Jewish determination to survive was repackaged as the will of all common people to go 